Tyler Childers. From performing his song Shake the Frost in 2011 at the Huntington Music Festival. You remind me of a Sunday back home in old Kentucky. To singing some of his biggest hits live at Red Rocks. There's no doubt that Tyler Childers worked his way up from small town shows in Appalachia to some of the most notable venues in the U.S. He captivated each listener by the longing and grit in his voice. Well, Daddy, I've been trying. I just can't catch a break. There's too much in this world. I can't seem to shake. Lastly, he's inspired so many musicians and songwriters in the music scene today by proving you don't have to follow the crowd to be a successful musician. So, how did he get here? My job is to help you understand his story and to fill in all the gaps. So this is the origins and rise of country music singer Tyler Childers. Timothy Tyler Childers was born on June 21st, 1991 in Lawrence County, Kentucky. He comes from a tight-knit loving family as his mom worked as a nurse for the local health department and his dad worked in the coal industry for over 20 years. As a kid, he would spend his free time playing baseball in the summer, hunting with his dad, and going to church on Wednesdays and Sundays. Tyler was brought up in church from a young age. He said he didn't really have a choice, but his favorite part every Sunday was when he got to hear the worship music they would play, which would eventually spark his love for Southern Gospel. His grandfather, he calls Papa, bought him a guitar when he was five, and it was at that age where he learned his first guitar chords. But it wasn't until his early teenage years when he started taking his music seriously. Before then, you would rather find him on the baseball field as a kid, thinking to himself that he was going to be the next pro baseball player. Tyler's grandpa would also be the one that would inspire his love for reading and writing, as they would sit and read Laura Ingalls Wilder and Jesse Stewart books together as a kid, which he ultimately credits with how he started to write his own music. This would fit naturally, as Tyler has lots of talented singers and people that can play music in his family. He recalled one time that even though his dad never liked to show his singing voice, on the way back from a hunting trip, he started to sing and he even had a great voice. Throughout Tyler's childhood, he would rummage through his dad's closet to find any music cassettes he could play, and some of these would be CCR, Alabama, and Leonard Skinner. When he listened to these bands, he pretended that he was playing guitar by picking up his coat rack and strumming and singing into it. Listen to what he said about his coat rack playing skills here in an interview with E-Town. I got really hooked on CCR, and I started like taking my coat rack and using it as a guitar and running around the room and like using it as a, also as a microphone. And, and somewhere in there, I was like, this would be a lot cooler if this wasn't a coat rack. <laughs> as he would grow up, his parents made the decision to have Tyler leave Lawrence County to Johnson County and attend Paintsville High School his freshman year. It would be there that he would start his first few bands with his buddies as a nearly 15-year-old, play his first local music festivals around the surrounding regions, and meet many friends that had similar musical interests. Tyler talked about how moving schools prepared him to live on the road as a musician by helping him adapt to new situations and surroundings. After high school and about the age of 20, he released his first full album, Bottles and Bibles, which was an assortment of acoustic-driven bluegrass and folk songs with sincere lyrics. It can be found on iTunes, Amazon, and, and SoundCloud, so... I think my grandma has one extra copy somewhere. <laughs> Many of these songs tie himself to his Appalachian roots, and songs like Hard Times and Coal. Throughout these songs in particular, he writes about the struggle and hardships of people working in the coal industry, with larger themes throughout the album of religion and spirituality. One of the more introspective songs on the record is the title track, Bottles and Bibles. In the song, he speaks about a pastor who has an alcohol addiction because of the end of a relationship. Tyler speaks upon the hypocrisy of people pointing fingers at the pastor because he has to walk the straight and narrow simply because he's a pastor. The song would eventually end in finding him face down by the stairs, dressed up for a sermon nobody would hear, which is one powerful lyric. Capping it off, Tyler sings at the end of the song, but they ain't had to walk with the weight that you've hauled. They don't know you at all, but they think that they do. To me, that is just spine chilling. Even though there are fan favorites from Bottles and Bibles, Tyler personally said in an interview with Blue's Kitchen TV, there was just something sonically missing on the record that led him to make different decisions on his upcoming albums. What was wrong about the first couple of runs at making a record? I really didn't have a have an idea of, of what I wanted to do. It was more like just expensive demos, honestly. Yeah. Um, and then the second one I felt <clears throat> there was just something sonically missing from it. Um, it, it just felt 
like demos too. Building momentum that he took off bottles and Bibles, Tyler was featured a few years later on Red Barn Radio, which on their website is described as a weekly syndicated radio program of bluegrass music, all recorded live, promoting and preserving the music of Kentucky. These live guest appearances were turned into two live recorded EPs, each with four songs. One released in 2013, Red Barn Radio 1, which has songs you might be familiar with like Shake the Frost and White House Road, which was backed by the acoustic string band The High Wall. The second EP, Red Barn Radio 2, came out a year later, which was just Tyler and his guitar, with songs such as Follow You to Virgie and Rock, Salt, and Nails. Ultimately, these were released in 2018 with all eight songs as a complete album. But why were those two EPs so important to Tyler's career? It was because it showed off Tyler's honest songwriting with his lyrics, and also just how mesmerizing his voice was at a bigger level. And Shake the Frost definitely just has to be one of my favorite songs. There's something just so calming and personal about it that I love. Resulting in more people taking notice of Tyler, he was invited in early 2017 to perform for Our Vinyl, which films live performances with both upcoming and established musicians. He performed three songs, Nose on the Grindstone, White House Road, and Follow You to Virgie. All three songs became popular with viewers and listeners, but there was one in particular that you could say honestly blew up on YouTube, and that was Nose on the Grindstone. Couldn't work anymore, he said, one of these days you'll get out of these hills. Keep your nose on the grindstone and out of the pills. Today, at the start of 2023, it has 35 million views and over 200k likes, which is just an insane number. A boy from Lawrence County, Kentucky, was now starting to reach people not just in Kentucky and surrounding states like West Virginia and Ohio, but the whole United States and really the whole world. I think what really got people on this track was his acoustic grit and the way he can paint a picture for listeners to imagine in their minds. Not to mention his voice perfectly fits in with the theme as you can hear the sorrow and longing he portrays. In this particular track, he talks about how the dad in the song, after working for Pike County Coal, wishes for his son to one day get out of the hills and to keep his nose on the grindstone and out of the pills, wishing for his son to have a better life and to not get bogged down by the battle of drug addiction. In the comment section to this day, you'll find out how many individual people are moved with this song, with their own battles of drug addiction, and how it helped them get clean, which is really cool to see. As Tyler was making progress with his music, building diehard fans and gaining national attention, he was able to meet someone in particular that would eventually be a great personal and working relationship between the two, and would be the start of his modern discography. Here comes his new record, Purgatory. One encounter you could say changed the course of Tyler's music career. About a year before they recorded Purgatory, he was playing a gig in Nashville at the basement when midway through his set he saw someone that he thought looked familiar. He finally realized it was none other than Miles Miller, who was Sergio Simpson's drummer. They chatted it up after the show and ultimately that interaction was able to put Tyler in a position to meet Sturgill at none other than a bingo hall in Estill County, Kentucky. It was there that the two got acquainted and a day later Tyler sent him a demo through email, ultimately leading to both of them working together on Purgatory. Tyler makes the fun joke of saying before he told the story of how he met Sturgill, that bingo hall was a spot Sturgill could get away to. Well, not so much anymore. When speaking to each other about the overall sound that they wanted to achieve, Tyler described what he was going for and Sturgill knew exactly what to do and bring in the right guys into the job. In a 2018 interview with GQ, he said, We just talked about what I was trying to accomplish, which was in the vein of the stuff that I grew up with. Bluegrass country like Ricky Skagg, Shady Crow, Keith Whitley, and Sturgill's from the same area as me, so he got what I was trying to do. Once they were done cutting the record, boy did they have a promising set of songs on the album. With that statement, the rest is history as they went to work at the butcher shop in Nashville with Dave Ferguson, a man that has worked with the talents of Johnny Cash, John Prine, Charlie Pride, and many more as a co-producer alongside Sturgill. Tyler Childers is definitely a straight shooter, and that's what you're going to get on this album. A lot of songs on this record lyrically make you want to get up and dance and stomp your feet, and others on this record are softer love songs that just soothe your brain. When you begin this record and hit play, it starts with the sound of Sweet Fail on the track of I Swear to God. Throughout the song, you get a nice kick of energy that sets the tone for the album. Some notable songs as you listen through is Feathered Indians, White House Road, and then Lady May. 
Of course there are some other gyms, but these rose to be the most popular with listeners. Starting with Feathered Indians, you could argue that this is the track that put Tyler in the position that he's in today, reaching almost 270 million streams on Spotify to this date. There's something about the little details of this love song that resonated with listeners, whether it be the memorable and warm acoustic guitar riff at the beginning of the song, or the superb storytelling with his lyrics, or just the rasp and scratch in his voice. This definitely became an anthem for many children's fans, especially when it was first released. White House Road, you could say, is the opposite in the way of the tone and the feel of the song, especially when he plays this with a full band. It makes you feel alive, want to get up from your seat and nod your head, but on the other hand, the lyrics are actually pretty intense, talking about the struggle of drugs and alcohol addiction, and how White House Road gives him what he needs to feed that kind of lifestyle. Ultimately in the song, people want him to get clean, but White House Road keeps him in that state of mind. Once you listen to White House Road acoustically, it's really kind of haunting as it gives the song a new perspective. Definitely listen when you get a chance. Lastly, you have Lady May. The love song written for his wife, Sonora May, and maybe the perfect wedding for his dance song. Childers uses many metaphors in this song, like describing how he's the hickory and his lady May is the axe. Listen to this lyric. I came crashing through the forest as you cut my roots away. And I fell a good long ways for my lovely lady May. I mean, can we talk about how good those lyrics are? He fell in love for his wife and describes through those lyrics, his deep love for her and how he ultimately fell for her. Overall, this album was a springboard for his career, and many publications and notable musicians would recognize Childers, and tons of new fans were rolling his way. It even led him to win Emerging Artists for the Americana Awards in this funny clip right here. And the award goes to Tyler Childers. My name is Tyler Childers. I'm an Appalachian artist from Foothills of East Kentucky and I play country music. As a man who identifies as a country music singer, I feel Americana ain't no part of nothing. And is a distraction from the issues that we are facing on a bigger level as country music singers. It kind of feels like purgatory. Thank you. It's now 2019, and after a quite a bit of touring with his backing band, The Food Stamps, he's ready to team back up with Sturgill and Dave Ferguson to make them the superhero trio that they are and record their next album. Could he follow up on his newest album, Country Squire? And it was this brand new Tyler Childers with an awesome haircut. Fans were eager to see how this record would sound. This record has a mix of songs that you know that will be hits and others that offer more of a storytelling perspective that round out the whole album. Not to say the others don't have a catchy sound, but some of these songs have a more noticeable hook than others. You still have that guitar and fiddle that are in most of Tyler's songs, while on a country squire, you can really hear the piano, organ, jaw harp, and a wider assortment of instruments used throughout the entire album. First, let's talk about the opening and title track, Country Squire. When you first hear this song, you automatically think, wow, that's some classic country that makes you want to jam out. That guitar riff right from the beginning grabs your attention. Lyrically, he talks about being out on the road to make a living in order to get his honey a country squire, which is an actual old camper. He also talks about eventually getting a cabin on the hill, but it might have to come over the highway to help out with the family bills. Throughout the song, there are lots of cheekiness that makes you want to smile, especially in the music video, but ultimately it's a song of working hard for a sweet lady in order to fuel their dreams to whatever they want to do and that might consist of having a country squire. I can't help but to mention that yes, Chillicothe has a paper mill there, and it smells bad. I was born there, so take it from me. After the album release, he actually got to perform the song live on the Seth Meyers show, and it put a smile on my face to actually hear someone say the town Chillicothe on live TV. Next, I want to talk about House Fire. You can set my house on fire, baby. This house is mighty cold yes, the song that you imagine people dancing around and stopping your feet, getting rowdy and all that gloriousness. When I first heard this song, I kind of thought about White House Road, 
not saying that these sound similar with the lyrics or even the instruments used, but maybe it's the percussion or the beat that gives me that same feeling that makes you want to get up and move and stomp your feet. The mix of acoustic guitars and electric guitars, banjo, fiddle, and even the organ towards the end will make you feel alive on this particular track. Lastly, we have to mention All Yorn, the love song that took the world by storm. This was noticeably his biggest hit since Feathered Indians, due to pulling people into the indie country scene that hasn't explored this genre before, which is a really cool thing to see. The way that the song uses the happy piano keys throughout the track and the line specifically when Tyler sings, I'm all yourn and you're all mine, is an automatic mood booster. That is what this song is, a mood booster. While some fans worried he drifted away from his signature sound on this one, I like the different use of instrumentation and his ability to reach wider audiences, but he still has that Appalachian influence in his voice. It's truly a crowd-pleasing song to anyone who loves music in general. To round out the album, some of my personal favorites include Bus Route, Creaker, and Gemini, which offer a closer look to some of his personal stories he's had that make for some good solid tunes. Country Squire earned him onto Billboard's Top Country Albums chart at number one, which was his first number one on the survey, which is just a huge accomplishment for anyone. Also, what do you think about this album art? I think it's pretty cool if you ask me. The year is 2020. Let's all not forget how crazy a year 2020 was. You had COVID, the George Floyd incident, riots because of police brutality, a new election, and other racially motivated occurrences that were going on in the US. And it was a hard time for everyone, and our country was really trying to figure out what it wanted to be. In September of that year, Tyler dropped Long Violent History, a collection of mostly instrumental songs that took you on a journey. And is a message from Tyler video that he posted on YouTube, he states it was his original goal to package it as an old-time fiddle album and let the piece make a statement on its own, taking the listener by surprise at the end, with the title track Long Violent History being the only song with lyrics. This song in particular definitely speaks upon those growing pains the US was going through in the year 2020 with its hard-hitting lyrics. An example would be when he writes, It's called me belligerent, it's took me for ignorant, but it ain't never once made me scared just to be. Could you imagine just constantly worrying, kicking, and fighting, begging to breathe? That one right there puts things in perspective and makes you think a little bit. All in all, Tyler just encouraged listeners to think and self-reflect, and that's about it, and I commend him for it. We're not as different as people think we are. Besides the title track, there are some really good songs on this record. I have to admit, at first I wasn't the biggest fan just because I thought it was going to be a children's record that we were used to. But later on, I started listening to it again, and wow, I'm hooked on these tunes. And I really have to say, this record is an underrated gem in its discography. Sometimes you're in the mood to chill out and just let the instruments themselves take you away. And that's exactly what they do on this album. Each song, I let the music guide my imagination to think of the settings and the scenes that are taking place in my head. A lot of these songs surprisingly have Civil War ties, particularly the rendition of Zolly's Retreat, which is named after a Confederate General Zollicoffer, who fell at the Battle of Mill Springs in Kentucky in 1862. An earlier recording of the song exists by Kentucky native Clyde Davenport. Frank Davenport, his fiddling grandfather, was a Union soldier in the battle, who actually fought at Mill Springs and witnessed the Confederates' defeat and retreat after Zollicoffer was killed. But when I don't have that context in mind, I see myself floating on a kayak in the morning watching the fog roll off the water or I'm sitting on my front porch out in the country with a cup of coffee in my hand. It's just relaxing to me. We also have the song Squirrel Hunter, which is another tune that has ties to the Civil War. Apparently, according to one interpretation of the history, Squirrel Hunter pays homage to a group of woodsmen who stepped up to fight off the Confederate Army from their planned attack on Ohio. So yes, some of the songs on the album are indeed covers, but great renditions of the original song. This one you can feel the energy, and you can imagine the suspense of all those woodsmen warding off some of the Confederate soldiers. Overall, most people might have to be in a certain mood or context in order to listen to this record, but I can listen to it anytime. It's grown to be one of my favorites for sure. There are others I like, such as Midnight on the Water and Sin and the Clowns. This is also an important time to mention that Tyler decided to make the choice to get sober in 2020 as well, and he's been sober ever since, which is a huge accomplishment and something to be really proud of.
As we've gone through his childhood years and most of his modern discography, we've come to the present day for his release, Can I Take My Hounds to Heaven? Some consider this album to be a curveball due to its southern gospel sound and Christian influences. It still has that Appalachian kick that you'd want in a children's record, but it's grounded in a traditional gospel setting which makes it really unique. You can't help but to notice that yes, this album is split into three different parts, the Hallelujah, Jubilee, and Joyful Noise versions. Starting with the Joyful Noise, it's mostly just instrumentals, and the Hallelujah and Jubilee is pretty similar, but I noticed that the Jubilee has a little bit more horned instruments and strings that are involved. On this album, Tyler transports you back in time to his church-going days as a kid, creating music he was inspired by and ultimately grew up with as a young boy. These are songs that are rooted in his culture, and I feel like it was only a matter of time before you got an album like this from him. So yes, even though you probably didn't expect this type of sound, it does really make sense for him. Tyler released the lead single Angel Band to start off this record in the late summer. He actually wrote a decent amount of these songs for this album a while before it was released. He even tried to pitch Angel Band to other musicians for them to play. Angel Band is a song that is as big as it gets. When you hear Tyler open the song with Hallelujah Jubilee, you can't help to imagine that you're transported into heaven as you enter those pearly gates. That is what this song is, euphoric. Especially when the trumpet hits at the end, it just makes it feel complete as a whole. Lyrically for this record, Tyler didn't want listeners to think that only people from his background or people from the Christian faith could listen to this. Angel Band is about living together in harmony and all serving whatever your God is together. And that's what you see in the music video for Angel Band as well, with the line, there's Hindus, Jews, and Muslims, and Baptists of all kinds. Catholic girls and Amish boys who've left their plows behind. The next song I have to mention on this album is Way of the Triumph God, which is actually an original song that was supposed to be a cappella. Old time screaming and a shout, go up, go up, tell it on the mountain. Faith too strong to be left out in Way of the Triumph God. As someone who doesn't regularly listen to Southern Gospel, I'm still jamming to this song in my car wanting to turn the volume all the way up. You just have to tap your foot to this. So yes, I will admit it, this is my favorite song from the record. You can imagine yourself right there in the pews on Sunday morning if you've grown up in a Baptist church in Appalachia. Another notable track is the title song, Can I Take My Hounds to Heaven. which is a fun song saying, hey, heaven sounds all good and nice, but if I can't take my dogs and hunt on God's ground, I'd rather go to the place that's the opposite of heaven with all my friends, and maybe at least be able to hunt. The song is actually a little bit funky with the guitar and has a certain groove to it, which I like a lot. And you still have that conviction in Tyler's voice when he sings, even if the lyrics are a little bit playful. This album as a whole does a good job of being able to take a peek inside Tyler's religious culture in Eastern Kentucky and experience a sound to what he was raised on, but in a way where listeners who aren't Baptist or even Christian can enjoy because of his message of inclusivity. But yes, I will admit that it would help to have a similar background to his to enjoy these set of songs to their full potential. I like this record overall, but I'd probably visit his earlier releases on Purgatory and Country Squire a little bit more just because of those children's classics. I commend Tyler for thinking outside the box and making some great music on Can I Take My Hounds to Heaven that deserves some praise. Whether it be pretending coat racks or guitars or stealing his parents' music to eventually recording Bottles and Bibles and all the way up to his last release, he's always been true to who he is as an artist and he stands up for what he believes in. There's a reason so many people are gravitating towards his music. His songwriting is sincere and it makes it ever more believable with the grit in his voice. I truly do think he'll go down to be one of the country music greats out of the 21st century and he'll be remembered for a long time. So, this was the origins and rise of country music singer Tyler Childers. So tell me, what's your favorite era of Tyler Childers and what makes you like his music so much? 
I'd love to know in the comments below. And if you've made it this far, thank you just for watching the whole video all the way through. It really does mean a lot to me. And it's so cool to build a community of country music fans and folk music lovers on this channel. We're almost at 1,000 subscribers, which is just an insane thing to see. And from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. Uh, I can't wait for the next video and I will see you guys soon.